Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for this COVID-19 and clean sport webinar um, brought to you by the, the WADA Athlete Committee. Um, this is the start of a series of webinars that we are hoping to bring to you over the coming months and I hope you join us for the remainder of the webinars. Uh, today we have about 900 people signed up to the webinar uh, joining us from around the world. Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us. We hope that you find this uh, informative uh, and that we're able to answer as many questions that you have about clean sport in these challenging times. Uh, my name is Ben Sanford. I am the chair of the, the WADA Athlete Committee. I'm a former skeleton athlete uh, and tonight I'm coming to you uh, live from my living room in New Zealand, uh, such as these times uh, dictate. So the topic for this webinar is uh, clean or well, COVID-19 and clean sport. And as all of you will be aware, uh, COVID-19 has swept around the world um, over the last six months and it's had an absolutely enormous impact uh, on all of our lives uh, and everything that we do. Um, it would be almost impossible to predict uh, six months ago that we would be in this position. Uh, it's had serious health consequences uh, and you know, has done untold damage uh, to people's lives uh, and to, to the way that we have operated um, our lives so far. Uh, and sport doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it very much exists as part of society. And so what we've seen is that COVID-19 has had a huge impact uh, on sport. And within sport, um, it has also had an enormous impact on anti-doping and clean sport. And obviously this, uh, this time has you know, brought forward huge challenges for sport uh, and for, for anti-doping. You've seen the Olympics postponed until next year. We've seen the cancellation of numerous events. Uh, international sport has essentially ground to a halt. Uh, and you as athletes uh, are living and trying to operate in incredibly uncertain times where um, you might be in lockdown, um, your training facilities might be unavailable, uh, you might not be able to comp compete at the moment, either domestically or internationally. Uh, and we acknowledge that these are really challenging times and they raise all sorts of questions, uh, not just about sport, but about what is happening with anti-doping uh, and clean sport. And so that is, what we want to talk to you about today. Um, during this pandemic, we've had, um, as the WADA Athlete Committee, a huge amount of questions come forward. And WADA has released a number of um, documents to help anti-doping organisations uh, get through this pandemic. Uh, and we have been involved with WADA to release um, two question and answer uh, documents that have focused on the questions that have been coming in from athletes. So. Um, I hope you found those helpful uh, and you can uh, find those on the, the WADA website. Um, but today we have uh, four speakers from um, around the world with uh, different organisations and different expertise. Uh, and I hope that um, our four speakers today will be able to um, talk you through some of the issues that they've faced, uh, how they're dealing with these issues in their organisations. Uh, and you know, give you some assurance that um, although sport might, might not be happening in the same way that it normally does, uh, anti-doping is not uh, sleeping and is very much still um, working uh, for your benefit and for the benefit of clean sport. Um, so the four speakers that we have today, um, so what we're going to do is I'll do this brief introduction and uh, the housekeeping. Um, and then I'll hand it over to each of our, our speakers and they'll each speak for five to ten minutes. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we will have a question and answer. Um, so the first of the speakers will be um, Dr. Alan Vernack, who is the Medical Director of WADA. Um, he will be followed by Tim Ricketts, who's the Director of Standards and Harmonisation at WADA. Uh, following him will be Benjamin Cohen, who's the Director General of the International Testing Agency. Uh, and he will be followed by Dr. Dr. Andrea Gossman, who is the chairperson of the executive board of the National Anti-Doping Organization of Germany. So we have four uh, very good speakers for you today. 
um, we really do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and you can do that, um, you can submit questions by using the questions tab um, on this platform. And that, on my screen anyway, is to the right of my screen. Um, so please write the questions and then once we've gone through all the speakers, um, I will put as many of these questions um, to our panellists as possible. Um, and if we don't get round to answering your question today, then um, I will attempt to, to write an email to you and answer it in the, the coming days. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, um, just a, a note about WADA's privacy policy. Um, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, WADA will not use personal information for any direct marketing or unsolicited follow-up unless you have first been informed of this uh, and expressly consented to this. Uh, WADA will not share personal information with third parties except where required by law or legal processes. Um, and there will also be a post-webinar survey to fill out at the end. Um, and all information submitted will be handled in a confidential manner. Uh, so that's the housekeeping and the introduction to this uh, webinar on COVID-19 and clean sport. And I will hand over to our first speaker, who is Dr. Alan Vernack, who is based in Montreal, and he is the medical director of the World Anti-Doping Agency. So Alan, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ben, and uh, good day, everyone. And uh, said it's a, a real pleasure to be able to uh, to participate here in, in this athletes webinar. Uh, the uh, first thing I just want to mention is, you know, we we're all here with the same goal, which is we want clean sport. Therefore, we know that we need to have some testing. But uh, athletes' health is actually the always the utmost importance to us. So we have to make sure that we try and uh, minimize the, the, the risk uh, as, as much as possible when we do some testing. So I'm gonna start us off by talking a little bit about, uh, about COVID. So the first thing is, uh, you know, I mentioned it's COVID in June, 2020. Uh, why is because if I give a talk in April, uh, things were quite different and in August, they may be different again. This is a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, many times when people talk about epidemics and diseases, uh, we look back years later and say, and start to see patterns develop. And so things are changing all the time. And it's, a, it's difficult for all of us, for you as athletes, but also for professionals to, uh, to keep uh, tabs on, on what the latest is. So first thing is talk about how contagious is it? I won't go into too much detail other than say that it is quite contagious and much more than the seasonal flu. Again, people talk about r knots and uh, you know the degree of contagiousness. Uh, measles is much uh, worse, but uh, again, this is a con considerably uh, contagious as a, as a pathogen. And the thing that we always have to remember is that how we act, such as with physical distancing and hygiene, has a huge effect on how contagious a disease is. There's a talk about, and one of the big problems is there's talk about asymptomatic and presymptomatic uh, people being able to spread the disease. And this is something that, uh, the, the, this is why it's such a problem and why the disease is spreading. Uh, there was something mentioned by the WHO recently that asymptomatic people are only rarely spread the disease, and they have kind of had to walk back on that, or at least clarify, which what they were referring to as as opposed to presymptomatic. Now, presymptomatic means if somebody catches the virus and is about just about to get very ill, in those two days before they kind of have a florid illness, they become very very contagious. Now, in practical concerns, it makes no difference. The person is in front of you has no symptoms and they can be contagious. So we know that and that's a problem. And that's why we have to be uh, uh, always acting accordingly. The idea is always that people in front of you, no matter where you are, you have to assume that they could have the virus. The incubation period, or in other words, the uh, time from exposure to illness is about two to 14 days. Uh, and usually uh, usually it's about five to seven. But the good news also is that when peop once people have become infected uh, and get ill, it, it's not, they don't be, stay infectious for long periods of time. So now the question is, how does it spread? So 
first thing is in main way is by respiratory droplets. If somebody coughs, coughs, sneeze, you breathe, they laugh in your face. Hopefully that doesn't happen too often. Uh, the viruses will it will go into your uh, into your mouth and your nose. It can go into conjunctiva of your eyes, and they can get into your body, and you get infected. Uh, something else would happen: somebody coughs into their hand, and then immediately shakes their hand, shakes your hand. You then touch your face. That's a very good way to transmit the virus. Other surfaces, we hear a lot, a lot about other surfaces, uh, and we know that it can last. The virus lasts uh, hours to days, and and there's there's no controversy. We know the virus is there, but nevertheless, this is not a major means of transmission. Most times when people get infected is because they are in an environment close to somebody who's spewing virus for long periods of time without masks. It's not the casual pass. It's not the simple, you know, touching. I still advise you to, you know, clean surfaces. Um, Montreal is a bit of an epicenter now for COVID, and I know that the grocers at the, or the, the supermarket on the corner, they have been exposed to COVID and they keep reporting different people who have it. So yes, I, I clean some of the groceries uh, when, when I come to my house. Um, there's always other areas like aerosols, feces, and you keep hearing these things, but these are very, very rare. We see viruses, but it's not the same thing as actually saying that uh, you can get the virus from these other means. So who is likely to get infected and, and will they get seriously ill? Again, these numbers are changing all the time and it depends what populations and countries uh, you're looking at. But more or less, you could say that 80% of the people will have pretty much either no disease or a fairly mild disease. And again, numbers changing. I've seen these anywhere from six to 41 to 50% talking about people who will be asymptomatic and meaning that they never get symptoms. So again, it's controversial numbers, but uh, uh, that's, uh, there's a good number of people who never gets uh, symptoms. But unfortunately, of course, they can still be transmitting the disease until the virus hits uh, uh, somebody who is vulnerable and then gets very sick. Again, a number of 80% are relatively mild. You can have 20% that can actually get quite seriously ill. And the death rates, again, these things are varying, but it's we say overall it's about 2%. If it's in the, you're looking at just at the under 20, the numbers are like 0.056% as what's once been shown in China versus somewhere into 13, 14% if you're over 70. So again, and that could be a 25 fold difference in death rate depending on your age. We do know that it's really, you know, once you start getting over 60, do you start seeing the, the worst hospitalizations, the ICUs, the deaths? And it's it really, once you get up 70, 80, 90, this is where I think in, in Quebec, where I live, 90% uh, of the deaths are, are, are people actually uh, 70 and over. Uh, and, and or we have to be aware that people with underlying medical conditions um, are also at, at risk. And of course, our Paralympic friends are, are uh, uh, often more at risk of having COVID. And as testing is increasing, uh, we start seeing uh, an increasing number of young people having the virus, but again, they're probably running around that now people are going to bars and restaurants, uh, protests, uh, whatever it be, and they're, they're getting out. So there's more and more of them being infected. But again, most that's so they're changing some of the numbers. My last uh, line in there is the, uh, the caveat that all of this, all these numbers can change uh, at any time. So preventative measures, this is probably one of the most important things. And this is what uh, Tim and others are going to follow up on. If you stay one to two meters away from a pers uh, another person, that's usually sufficient to prevent uh, getting the COVID, getting the virus through the breath. If people are wearing masks, it uh, it increases the, the protection. So the mask, if, if I have COVID and I put on a mask, I am not going to spray any respiratory droplets on, on anyone. It's going to be on the uh, through the mask. If uh, you're wearing a mask in, and it will also protect you to some degree. I won't, we don't have time to go into the details, but some masks 
are kind of the professional ones used uh, in in, uh, in hospitals, N95s, and then all the different uh, diff degrees of masks. But even cotton and linen masks uh, are, are effect very effective uh, in preventing spread, but also to some degree even pre prevents you from uh, from getting it. But I'll tell you, if everybody's wearing masks, the the disease will go down. Uh, will essentially uh, go away much, much quicker. Um, hand washing should be a, a, a part of your religion. And interesting, as a sport uh, medicine physician, it's been 25 years I've been telling my athletes at every game, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. There's plenty of other illnesses around there. It doesn't have to be COVID. I'll skip for time, but these are basic things, coughing, sneezing, disinfecting, and uh, uh, PPE is a personal protective equipment, but that's only uh, where appropriate. So the last uh, slide that I'm going to talk about is the testing, because we do get a number of questions on this. Uh, this is whether athletes themselves should be tested or should DCOs be tested. So first of all, there's two types of tests. One of them is the test to see if you have the, the virus, and this is, are you infected? So this is where you've seen also in the pictures where they stick the swab uh, halfway up into your brain and they, they try and uh, test to see if you had a, a virus or virus particles and you get the results back uh, relatively rapidly. Uh, and these are, rel these are fairly accurate tests, but there may be some false positives or negatives. Uh, to give you an example, if you were, uh, you, you were infected yesterday, this test will probably falsely negative. It won't show up on the test today. The other problem is if I, if I don't have, I'm not infected and I have a true positive, a true a negative, but I can get the virus tomorrow. And so are you gonna start testing people every two days, every three days? Now, a lot of these things are depending on, on what the local health uh, guidelines are. Uh, or the regional ones or national ones. And I can tell you in Canada, for example, the recommendation that if somebody does not have a reason to be tested, uh, they should not be tested. So in other words, if they don't have any symptoms or recent contacts, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't generally test people. The other test is something completely different, and this is to see if you were infected. So two to three weeks, more or less, after an infection, you develop antibodies to a, to a virus. Now these tests are, there's a lot of different types of them and they are much less reliable as a test itself. Um, and on top of it, so if, if you have a, a result that says, you know, again, a false negative, it says that you have antibodies, but you really don't, um, then it's a dangerous thing because people can start relaxing. They think, oh, they're immune um, and they, they don't take as many precautions. So this testing is not terribly useful for individuals, but it is useful on a kind of a, a society-wide basis. So you're looking at groups of people, you're looking to see is, uh, you know, where it's spreading in communities and, and uh, doing all sorts of data analysis of that way. So it is useful on that level. And just the very last word I wanna say is just about the immunity itself. We're still in early days and, you know, how if you have antibodies, Will you be immune? How, uh, how strong an antibody response uh, do you need before you, be, uh, you become immune? And even if you have that, will the immunity last three months, six months, or a year later? Nobody really knows. So um, that's, where we're, that's where we're going. And obviously that would have a, some effect on, on uh, vaccines, which blissfully I'm not gonna be talking about. So uh, that's where I'm gonna end here. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, you know, it's really useful to have the medical situation set out because that's been what is dictating um, how we operate um, anti-doping in this space. So that's fantastic. Um, our next speaker is uh, Benjamin Cohen, who is the Director General of the International Testing Agency. Ben, uh, Hi. <laughs> good to I see you. Took over. Why, uh, and, uh, Yep, we can hear you uh, well and see you well, uh, and so we'll hand over to you. Um, hi everyone, and uh, as, as uh, Ben said, I'm, I'm the Director General of the ITA, the International Testing Agency. For those of you who do not know us, we were 
established two years ago by, by the International Olympic Committee and the Olympic Movement uh, with the support of WADA uh, to uh, promote independence and expertise in the fight against doping. So what we do at the ITA is we manage uh, anti-doping program for international sports federations and major event organizers. We do that independently from the international federations and the major uh, event organizers. So we are now managing a little bit more than 45 different international sports federations program, partly or in full, as well as the Olympic Games uh, programs, youth Olympic Games uh, anti-doping programs as well. So we're busy for sure. We have been very busy uh, at the, the, over the, the, the six uh, past months. And of course the COVID has uh, caused us uh, a number of logistical issues, but I believe for, for you too, we here, uh, we're, we're here to protect you, of course, and so uh, we have seen and we have had a lot of feedback from the athletes on, on everything that was going on, and so thank you for that. And please, uh, all of you in attendance, if you have more feedback, please feel free to, to reach out uh, to us. Um, the impact, of course, for us is clear. We coordinate testing all over the world for, for the 45 plus international sports federations that uh, program that we manage. So we've seen already back in January that some issues uh, were happening in, in Asia and in China uh, and, and so uh, indeed I, I think a team mentioned that you've seen the graph I think in March we were almost not able to conduct any testing I think we did uh, less than 50 tests uh, in March where in, in normally we would do more than a thousand tests uh, in a given month so the out of competition testing was extremely complicated uh, because of all the logistical, the, the, the border control, the, the issues to ship uh, the samples to the laboratories. Some laboratories were closed, so that, that was extremely complicated. And of course, as, as you know, uh, testing is done out of competition and in competition. And since all the, all, all the sports events were, were cancelled or postponed, there were practically no in, in competition testing uh, either. Uh, you know as well that the athlete's biological passport relies on the analysis of samples and therefore the athlete biological passport program uh, was also heavily um, impacted by, by, by the COVID. So we had to somehow find a way to continue uh, working and fighting for, for a clean sport and so what, what we did is to focus on those areas of an anti-doping program that could go on, that could continue. Of course, so testing, uh, we tried uh, as much as possible to continue testing but of course the, the idea is to, was and is to prioritize your safety and your health over testing at all costs. So we don't want to test if we believe that uh, we are not 120% convinced that this can be done safely. So we have, of course, uh, taken into consideration all the WADA guidelines. Uh, we have been in touch with NADOs all over the world since we test uh, literally in every single uh, country in the world. We've been uh, in touch with NADOs to, to um, um, uh, get familiar with, with domestic regulations and we have ourselves designed some additional uh, testing protocols for the organizations that collect samples on our on our behalf. So of course all the sanitary uh, precautions, the social distancing, uh, sanitizing, cleaning all the surfaces, the equipment, asking the doping control officers to avoid uh, the use of public transportation to to uh, go on, on a mission, et cetera, et cetera. If they felt any symptom, any issue, they should refrain from, from going uh, and, and, and testing you. So we've done those additional, uh, we've taken those additional testing precautions. And then we focused on, on those other areas that, that could go on. Uh, one of them was education. Um, I hope that some of you have attended some of the ITA webinars that, that we have developed. Uh, of course, uh, we have invited WADAs, some NADOs, some ph uh, pharmacists, some experts, and of course, every webinar had an athlete in attendance. We wanted to continue promoting clean sport and explaining, uh, taking this opportunity to explain uh, athletes some, some, some or, or give and provide you uh, some very important information on TUEs, on whereabouts, uh, on supplements, etc., uh, etc. Et so I hope this was useful. They're all online, so feel free uh, if if you have time to to log in on on ITS website and look at those webinars if you're interested. I'm sure you will find uh, them interesting. We have of course continued as well to issue therapeutic use exemptions. So if 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 you had uh, still a need to 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 take a, a prohibited substance to treat a medical reason uh, conditions, we have continued to do that work. We have continued the work, unfortunately on result management, meaning prosecuting 
uh, positive cases and imposing anti, uh, um, uh, sanctions for anti-doping rule violations. So that continued. Um, and we have continued our work in intelligence gathering, investigations on, on many fronts and for many sports that uh, we uh, manage. We have, and I'm, I'm very proud also to say that, and to, uh, we will announce it next uh, week, we uh, have seen and we have heard athletes telling us that, especially international level athletes, because these are the athletes that we cover, that depending on the countries they are in or depending the, uh, on the sports they practice, they feel that they are tested dif differently, that there are different testing uh, procedures applying on them uh, depending on where they are. And so we have um, created a, a training program and, and certification program for international doping control officers. So we want to provide you the guarantee that whatever sport you practice, whatever you are, uh, the international doping control officers that will come in and test you will have been through uh, a harmonized uh, training program to, to make sure that uh, you are treated safely uh, all over the world, wherever you are. So we will be announcing that next week. And of course, if you're a, as an athlete, you want to support this initiative, please reach out to us and we will be happy to, to tell you how you, you can support that. Uh, and finally, um, as you know, we, we manage, we will manage the program of the Tokyo 2020, 2021 uh, Olympic Games. Uh, and since they were postponed, uh, of course, all the logistics was ready. I was due to, to leave to Tokyo tomorrow, actually. Uh, and so we have had to put, of course, the, the program on hold until next year, hoping that the, the, the event will take place. Um, now, we will adapt, of course, the testing plan and, and all the logistics, but I think it's important for you to know that a pre-games expert group was established by the ITA. This expert group is composed of five uh, representatives of international federations, five representatives of uh, NADOs, and, and these experts are looking at the testing that is being done across the world on athletes that are likely to, to go to the Olympics to ensure a level playing field, to ensure that whoever is going to go to Tokyo will have been subject to a proper testing program so that you can be confident that you will be treated uh, the same way as all other uh, Olympians uh, reaching Tokyo. So this expert group has had to put on hold, of course, uh, their testing recommendations, and the work will, will uh, resume, I would say, in the fall, August, uh, August, September this year, and they will then review the testing that is being done uh, across the world and provide testing recommendations to international sports federations and national anti-doping organizations to ensure that there is proper testing being done uh, in the lead up to, to the Olympic Games. Then ITA during the Olympics will be taking care of the testing program during the Olympic Games. So that includes therapeutic use exemptions, testing, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think very short, uh, that concludes uh, what we've been doing uh, at the ITA. And of course, if you if you have any questions and if you need any support, please feel free uh, to reach out to us and we'll be, we'll be happy to support. So good luck uh, all of you with, with uh, all your competitions and training. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. And as you can all tell, uh, the ITA has got a, a lot of work that it does around the world. And so thank you very much, uh, Ben, for the work that you're doing and for the information that you've provided. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, um, enter them in the, the question uh, tab bar and we'll come to them um, once we've heard from all the speakers. Uh, so I'll Next speaker is Dr. Dr. Andrea Gotsman, um, who is a research, research associate at the German Sport University of Cologne. She's also a former uh, German national basketball player uh, and is the chairperson um, of the executive board of the NADO in Germany, uh, which is NADA. Uh, so, Andrea, um, I'll hand it over to you now um, so you can uh, talk about your experience. Thank you very much and I would like to give you a short overview from the perspective of a national anti-doping agency what we did or we are still doing during this COVID-19 pandemic and I guess first of all it might be helpful to get a small overview what happened within Germany and I guess this is uh, not the same in every country, not even in Europe, how things develop and where how national anti-doping agencies had to react. You, so you see on this timeline in the very first beginning of March, so there have been the first measures taken 
to prevent the virus from spreading. So the behavioral code, daily assessment of the overall situation, and also the test sampling under certain restriction. But on the other hand, day by day, the situation became more worse. And on the, the 9th of March, we also gave out public information. So we did it by press release, what's going on, and what are the specific issues done by NADA. A few days later, on the 12th of March, we have taken out the physician from the testing process. So due to legislation in Germany, blood samples only can be taken by physicians and those people are heavily needed in the hospitals and should not take uh, blood samples and anti-doping and therefore we stop this uh, blood sampling. Then on the 23rd of March, so we decided this has complete suspension of testing and this was also done with a press release. We wanted to be very transparent, but on the other way, we also informed the athletes and also the whole community and the media that there is more within anti-doping work than testing. So that uh, e-learning courses in education is going on, that the intelligence and investigation department is very active. And that we also have the possibility with some capacities at the laboratories to reanalyze stored samples with a more intensive program. Maybe they haven't been done their uh, EPO tests in the first screening, then that could be applied. And we started a kind of bright blood spot project. And later on, I would like to focus on this. Uh, a day later, there was a postponement of the Olympic and Paralympic Games Tokyo 2020. Um, so we had reduced our testing to zero. But times became a little bit better after the, or during the complete shutdown within Germany. On the 16th of May, you may have heard about it, so the German Football Federation started the so-called ghost games. So games, so the Bundesliga was finished under specific strict hygienic and security measures and without spectators. But just want to let you know how our NADA Dried Blood Spot project in 2020 worked and what is the framework. And first of all, I would like to focus that this is a scientific project in cooperation with the Center for Preventive Doping Research at the German Sport University in Cologne. And our goal was to have a contribution to enhance this technique in anti-doping first on the operational and also on the analytical aspects. So the first project was done by us in 2015, so where young athletes performed within an education lesson, described blood spot tests just to show them what are the responsibilities of an athlete when he's starting his or her career. The second project was in 2016, just to compare the traditional methods and sampling with urine and blood samples with the analytical results of dried blood spot. We see it as an alternative testing method also in the time of COVID-19 pandemic because it could be also performed as non-contact testing. But to make it crystal clear, we want to protect athletes against wrong accusations of doping without limits. And that have been the headlines here in our newspapers and online and on TV because there have been no testing and athletes were accused that it's now the paradise for doping. And this is something that's also our task. We want to catch the cheaters, but we also want to protect the clean athletes and give them a possibility also in those different and strange times to show that they are working clean. So the conditions are, there was an ethical approval, approval of the project by the university. It is a voluntary participation of German top athletes. And be clear here, there are no consequences for athletes due to refusal or any analytical result. It is a scientific project maybe with good results for the future. And we have been that transparent from the very first beginning because this 
testing could be in line with the hygienic measures of COVID-19. So I skipped this a little bit. We took, we asked some German athletes from the Olympic long list for Tokyo 2020. This was a personal request of a selected group of athletes and we received confirmation to participate in this project within shortest time and until today we could perform about 60 DBS tests and this was a great success for us. Just from the principle, what does the dried blood spot mean? So this is a classical form, it's a finger prick and some, so that means four blood drops will be placed on a filter card after drying for 10, 15, at least 20 minutes, this card can be sent to a laboratory and there they cut out these spots and do the extraction and analysis and this fluid will be analyzed with the well-known techniques in anti-doping work at the laboratory. That's how the package looked we have sent to our athletes who participated in the test. So it was a so-called NADA DVS package. They received it by mail. It had a project letter, detailed instructions, declaration of content to participate. We designed a special DVS control form. And in the middle, you see the so-called TASO device. So this is something that make it much easier for athletes to perform this test by themselves. We also have an evaluation sheet. And on the right side, you see the envelope for the reshipment of the TASA device. So athletes are called by phone based on their whereabouts. And then when we got contact, we switched to video conference after notification. And then there was a step-by-step -step instruction by NADA staff sample collection single-handed by the athlete and this is a TASO device and you can see the four blood spot places here and afterwards the shipment of the sample and now we have blood on the spots here and the documents to NADA Germany by a specific career and our staff forwards the sample to the Center of Preventive Doping Research under all the regulation of data protection and the anonymity of the athletes. So here you, you can see some pictures how this worked because we communicated this project, project, we communicated with the athlete and we are the athlete and on the left side you see a post on social media from an athlete showing the director of our testing department and they performed this test together. On the right side, you see an ouch, but it's not a real ouch. It's a little bit more fun on this. But we also communicated this project within the media. The media who first uh, made the accusation to the athletes, they were all dopers and they had paradise in doping times. And we could see that they also accepted this kind of method that athletes want demonstrate that they support the testing and that they want to show that they are clean athletes. And here, last week, we got the chance, you see here, this is not somebody from the Olympic long list for Tokyo, but this is Felix Loch, who heard about our project and he is Olympic gold medalist in Luge. And he wanted to perform this test too. And here it was followed by one of the major broadcasting companies in Germany. And so this became also very informative for all other athletes how this test was performed. So here you see Stefan on the left side, how the athlete has to place the TASA device on its arm. And on the right side, you see Felix, how he is performing the test. So maybe some further information. There is a possibility also with this right blood spot, right blood spot test to do the SARS-CoV-2 antibody test. We have heard that it has restriction, but maybe later on it might be helpful information for sport 
to see and also for society to see how the spreading was of this virus. And it's very helpful for education and prevention when there's a first contact with testing for young athletes. It's time saving with sampling and any kind of combination with traditional testing, urine or blood is possible. And we see also the developments regarding the Olympic Games in Beijing that this test might become also part of the usual testing we are looking forward to it and thank you very much for your attention, Nada. So this means for clean competition, just for your understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, and it's, it's really good to hear um, what anti-doping organizations have been working on um, during this pandemic and how they've been trying to, to solve the issues that the, the pandemic have put in front of us. Um, and as Andrea has outlined, um, for there to be a, an anti-doping control by an anti-doping organisation, there are obviously lots of rules that the organisation has to follow, um, and that's set out in what's called the International Standard for Testing and Investigations. Uh, and COVID-19 has, you know, in many ways, made that very difficult for anti-doping organisations. And so um, a number of anti-doping organisations around the world have tried innovative um, ways to, to still be doing uh, doping control and um, that's a good example of uh, how the German NATO has uh, used their dry blood project um, for this. Um, we've also seen um, the USA anti-doping organisation um, roll out a project whereby athletes were collecting their own samples um, and certain safeguards were put in place to make sure that uh, the samples were collected correctly and were genuine. Um, and another example is in Norway, I think it is, they've had a van, um, so instead of the doping control officers going into the athlete's house, um, the doping control officers have turned up at the address uh, and the athletes have gone into a, an anti-doping van, I guess you can call it, um, which is a space that is um, you know, specially cleaned, uh, to make sure that it's it's safe and no one's going to um, be getting COVID-19, um, but it also complies with the um, international standard, which it has to. Our next speaker is uh, Tim Ricketts. Uh, Tim is the Director of Standards and Harmonisation at uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, um, also based in, in Montreal. And uh, he will sort of delve into more the specifics of um, Alan's described what the medical situation is, and then Tim will go on to describe how that's affected anti-doping. Over to, to you, Tim. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Um, my presentation will provide an, an overview of some of WADA's activities during COVID-19, including taking a look at the impact that the pandemic has had on testing programs and the enhanced health and sanitary precautions that have been recommended for sample collection and which athletes can expect when they are next tested, especially now that countries are starting to, to deconfine. From WADA's perspective, this all began in early February uh, when the Chinese National Anti-Doping Organization contacted WADA and advised us uh, of the impact the new virus was having in China and that they were considering suspending their testing program due to the lockdown of the country. And as the virus started to spread globally, WADA issued two key documents uh, in March. The first one was guidance for anti-doping organisations on COVID-19, uh, which provided a number of recommendations on various anti-doping programs. And secondly, uh, as Ben mentioned earlier, in an athlete question and answer document, which was developed in conjunction with the WADA Athlete Committee and covered a number of situations that athletes uh, had inquired about. Now, to ensure all this information and guidance was available in a central location, a specific COVID-19 section was set up on WADA's website, and it contains all the information uh, that has been published to date on COVID, and I encourage all the athletes to, to check that out. By early April, uh, 141 national anti-doping organisations had announced or made WADA aware 
that they had stopped or significantly reduced their testing. So this was around 70% of all the national anti-doping organisations. In addition, at this time, a number of WADA accredited laboratories had also closed their doors or reduced their services. Now, when looking at the impact on testing, this graph shows the number of samples that have been collected from January to June 2020. The green columns are the number of samples collected, which includes urine, blood, uh, and the athlete biological passport. And the orange line is the number of testing authorities that conducted the testing, which includes NATO's international federations and the major event organizers. Now, really in March, where there's just over 11,000 samples collected, we can clearly see the impact that COVID was having with over a 50% drop in samples compared to uh, February. And whilst April almost came to a standstill, there was still around 600 samples that were collected globally by 33 testing authorities. However, the good news is that we can see in May, 2,600 samples, and in June, over 7,000 samples have been collected, and the number of testing authorities increasing from 33 in April to 89 in June. So we expect to see this trend uh, to continue on the same path uh, in July and hopefully moving forward. In addition, it's important to note that while testing has been significantly reduced, that intelligence gathering and investigations have continued throughout COVID. There are also other tools that can assist us in times of limiting, limited testing, such as the athlete biological passport, as well as the long-term storage of the first samples that are collected post-confinement, which can be reanalyzed in the future with new and enhanced scientific detection methods. So for obviously following uh, what happened in April and the real impact of where testing almost ground to a, to a halt, uh, we were in a different environment in which how testing could uh, or needed to, to start up again and due to the, the situation that we were in with, uh, with the virus. As such, it was important for us to ensure that the anti-doping organisations had access to a standard set of health and sanitary procedures to protect the health of the athlete, the sample collection personnel and everyone else involved in the system, including the laboratories. Uh, this document or these Procedures could be then further developed and implemented in accordance with any national government policies. The aim being that testing could get back as quickly as possible and in a safe way. So as such, we worked closely with a group of experts uh, from the national anti-doping organisations and we developed a return to testing guidance document which was published in early May. And from feedback that has been well received by not only the testing authorities, but also the athletes that have been tested as well. We'll go on to the next slide. Thanks. So in looking at these enhancements to the, uh, or the precautionary and preventative measures to the existing sample collection process, um, this starts really with the selection of the people that are actually doing the testing, the doping control officers and, and blood control officers uh, as well. And these are, should be selected from a group uh, at a not at risk, high risk group. So Alan mentioned the high risk uh, areas or groups of persons. So these DCOs should not be selected from that group. They then need to be trained on the personal uh, protection equipment and the use of this, as, as well as sanitizing protocols as well. In addition, each doping control officer is required to complete a self-assessment survey prior to going on to an actual testing mission. Uh, and this is basically to uh, evaluate whether they have any symptoms of COVID, and if so, then obviously they wouldn't go on that mission. This is documented and it's returned to their testing authority before every test that they do. All the equipment that's used for testing should be sanitized as well, as well as the use of gloves and masks should be used by the DCO uh, for the whole procedure as well. It's also important that they disinfect the surfaces, both prior to using them and after they're using them as well. And as Alan mentioned, hand washing, uh, we can never wash our hands enough, so washing hands from the start or sanitizing from the start of the session, 
before the sample is provided, the athlete will be asked to wash their hands with just water, not with soap or sanitizer. After they provide the sample, they can then use soap and sanitizer, and again, at the end of the testing session. In addition, uh, the doping control officer will also remove all the waste that's generated from the testing session. And obviously social distancing, one to two metres where possible. We obviously know that in some situations around small toilet areas or when blood is being collected, that this may not be possible. But we feel that the additional sanitary measures and the uh, personal protection equipment that the doping control officer is in place and hopefully the athlete is there to protect everyone in these situations. In terms of the sample collection uh, preventative measures, education should also be important before anyone starts. So uh, educating the athletes about the process and everyone else that's involved. The other important aspect is the health assessment of the athlete at the time the doping control officer comes to the location where testing is, uh, is taking place, and particularly the athlete's house. And the athlete will be asked to, to complete a health assessment to determine if they or anyone living with them has COVID or COVID symptoms. And the doping control officer will ask the athlete to sign a document that contains the answers to these questions, uh, which also contains a warning as well about uh, the consequences providing false information. If the answer is yes, then the test should not proceed and that will be reported back to the testing authority who will follow up with the athlete as required to validate the situation. If the answer to the health questions are that no, they don't have any symptoms or uh, anyone that lives with them, then the test should go ahead. However, if the, if the athlete answers no to those, but then refuses to accept the notification or refuses to provide a sample after they have been notified, then a refusal will be reported and the normal results management process would follow, which would include an investigation into the situation and the individual circumstances of the situation. And a reminder that obviously there's a sanction or a refusal, maybe up to four years if it does uh, get to that stage. And just finally to wrap up in terms of next steps, um, we're obviously WADA will be continuing to monitor the situation and to communicate to all our stakeholders, to keep them up to date. This includes monitoring the global level of testing that uh, I was showing in the graph earlier and looking at how the health and safety precautions are being implemented and if they can be further improved. And we certainly welcome any feedback uh, that the athletes would have on those and that should be provided to the testing authorities or even back to WADA. And finally, we're establishing a group uh, that will look into the impact or evaluate the impact that COVID has had on the anti-doping community, in particular on testing and looking at how if we need to tweak the procedures in any way to make us in, uh, better prepared to deal with these situations moving forward. So that information, uh, the outcomes of that meeting will be circulated and shared with our stakeholders once it occurs. So, Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, so now we have a, a few minutes left, which we will go into the, the Q&A. Um, so thank you to everyone who sent through questions um, and we have some uh, questions prepared as well. Um, the first question, if everyone can turn their cameras back on so we can all see you. I don't want to be here alone answering all the questions. Um, so the first question, Tim, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the first question uh, might be uh, to you. Um, it's about the remote testing that some anti-doping organisations uh, have been doing. Um, and do you know how many anti-doping organisations uh, have been doing this type of innovative remote testing? Um, and also, how do you see it developing in the future? Is this something that's going to um, stay around with us um, once the COVID restrictions are lifted? Sure, thanks Ben. Um, yeah, we've been made aware of five countries that have taken the initiative uh, to innovate and to develop a modified program uh, during COVID. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of them, uh, which I heard uh, just at the end of Andrea's uh, presentation there. 
Uh, I can cover, give you some background on those. I mean, three of those involved uh, posting or dropping off the sample collection equipment uh, to the athlete's house and then through a video conference call asking the athlete to conduct the sample collection and the sealing of the procedure themselves without the DCO actually entering the house of the athlete. So two of these programs, the doping control officer waited outside the house uh, and then instructed the athlete through the, the phone or tablet and then they collected the sample from the athlete once it was completed. The other required the athlete to package the sample up and then a courier would be uh, arranged to come and collect that. Now, it's important, I think, to note that all three programs do not observe the uh, provision of the sample um, on the camera. The phone doesn't go into the, into the toilet for obvious reasons. So this is just one area of departure that we need to look at how we can find a way around that potentially to ensure that um, is the integrity of the sample is um, is maintained and there's no chance really to manipulate that sample in any way. Um, another organisation had uh, provided uh, the athletes with 24 to 48 hours notice, advance notice that they were going to be tested and then assigned them a location to go to, a sanitised location. So that sample was uh, was witnessed and uh, was collected. However, obviously the advance notice aspect is a, is a core core aspect of, of doping control that we need to find a, a way to try and align that better. And as you mentioned, the fifth was the, uh, the, the mobile camping truck or the, the, the RV that uh, was turned into a sanitised doping control station on wheels and, uh, and drove around the country testing all the athletes outside of their home. And this program we found to be in line, fully in line with the, the, the international standard for testing investigation. So a variation of different innovative uh, programs there. And uh, we've taken an, uh, we've looked at those, uh, reviewed the initial procedures and provided some feedback. And we'll also, uh, we have requested a final report once those programs are finalized. And this will be part of this expert group that's uh, being put together to look at all those programs to see if we can find some synergies for dealing with situations where we are in total lockdown and to ensure that samples can potentially be collected in that situation in the future. So some good work happening out there and we, we, we need to evaluate that and, and see if we can find some, some good ways to move forward. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, next question uh, to you, Alan. Um, there's a question about uh, as we move sort of further along the line of this uh, pandemic, we're going to see, uh, or hopefully we'll see uh, vaccines and treatments uh, come online. Um, and there was one that has been promoted recently. Um, I think it's a steroid, um, which I will not try and pronounce because my pronunciation of medicines is terrible. Um, but will athletes be able to get TUEs uh, if they're being treated? Uh, yes, thanks, Ben. It's an important question and I've seen a few of the questions where people are, are asking what happens and what's the process and uh, uh, of taking a medication that would be otherwise be, be prohibited. And I think uh, people need to read more about how the therapeutic use exemption system works because it works uh, exactly for these types of conditions. The specific question was they're talking about this new corticosteroid, which is dexamethasone, which hit the papers uh, a week or two ago as one of the few uh, drugs that can be used to treat uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, serious illnesses. Uh, and, and this miracle drug and the things that was touted. This is a drug that's been used around for years for all sorts of situations. It's a very effective anti-inflammatory uh, treatment and is actually one of the most commonly used drugs for, by athletes for all sorts of reasons. In this particular case, with uh, dexamethasone being used to treat COVID-19, this will not be an issue in the world of anti-doping for, for two reasons. One is you can always apply for a therapeutic use exemption. And if you have a legitimate reason, it would be granted. But the reality is this medication is only being touted as being effective when somebody is extremely ill on ventilators or in the, in the ICUs and when they're having what they call a cytokine storm. And why I want to say this is because if you take glucocorticoid and you think because you have mild 
uh, uh, COVID-19 symptoms, that would be the worst thing that you can do. And they show that in the studies because glucocorticoids are a, um, uh, they suppress the immune system. They're an anti-inflammatory, but they suppress the immune system. So that would be the worst thing uh, that you can do. So just to repeat, it uh, will not be a problem in anti-doping. If anybody ever needed it, they just apply for a therapeutic use exemption uh, as per the usual process. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I've got a, a question for you and then Tim will go to you finally and I think after that we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, there's been a few questions um, during the pandemic and um, a few questions that came through today about um, where an athlete can be tested um, and Andrew, I'm just wondering from a, your experience in Germany, um, where can athletes be tested? Is it exactly the same as it's always been? Um, or has that been narrowed down at all? So right at the moment, we are nearly back to normal testing numbers, I must say. So we started in football with the in-competition, with the so-called ghost games, um, where we had a very strict uh, hygienic concept. And with those experiences, we also started our out-of-competition testing system so with uh, special requirements regarding distancing, hygienic measures, disinfection. And so we came from zero samples. We are close back to normal numbers with 1,000, 1,000 tests per month. But there are no competitions at all. There have been football and there have been a few basketball games. But so what we are missing right at the moment is the in-competition testing but out of competition testing, we are close to normal numbers under those specific restrictions. And we are very careful and we observe the situation. And as soon as there is any doubt, so we go back and keep an eye on it daily. Thank you. Uh, ben, before I go to you, I've just got one question that uh, maybe Alan or Tim might be able to answer. It's a question about um, whether a doping control officer would be able to, who's a doctor, would be able to perform a COVID-19 test on an athlete, you know, within a doping control situation. Uh, Tim, you may want to take that. I, I don't really see why a doctor is going to be doing COVID-19. What has that has to do with with anti-doping? Um, so uh, I don't I don't see an, an issue with that. Maybe. There's some rules that you know about testing uh, and investigations. No, I'm, I'm not aware as, as to what that situation would be, so sorry. If I, if no. I may on that, since we, we've seen that, uh, Ben, if you allow me. Yeah, uh, yeah please. Some, some, some doctors have been involved, have been on the front line uh, in the hospitals with COVID, and I think if they have been exposed, uh, we, we would ask that they refrain from conducting a, a mission. What we have seen in, in some organizations is, is that some doping control officers who are actually working as medical doctors were called to act for COVID and could no longer be available uh, to conduct a testing mission. So we've actually seen the contrary. Yeah, yeah I Thanks. think that the idea of a physician doing a, a, a test as, a, as an extra um, act I, as I said, has nothing to do to with with, uh, with the anti-doping, but I think your point, Ben, is very important. That uh, uh, any DCO who has been involved in situations where they may be exposed uh, uh, to viruses or conditions where they really should not should should reconsider uh, working as a DCO on, at least until they have two weeks where they did some self quarantine and stayed away from anybody who had COVID. So we fully agree to this as uh, soon as there are some small symptoms only with coughing or so we yeah. want to keep those DCOs oh. out of the business. Exactly. Thanks everyone. Uh, final question to you Ben and it's uh, more of a, a general uh, question uh, is you know do you have any concerns moving forward we have the Olympics coming up next year we still have uh, you know COVID, um, you know, spreading around the world and around different countries at different uh, different speeds. Uh, does this open up opportunities for, for athletes to dope? Um, and, you know, what are your concerns and what are you doing to sort of uh, 
um, you know, prevent that doping or look into that. Yeah. I, th I think uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the COVID uh, situation is, uh, you know, opening the doors for, for athletes uh, to dope. I think the athletes who are here in the room, in the virtual room, would, would agree with that, that uh, they also have uh, priorities, health priorities, taking care of families, and I'm not sure they would jump on doping substances just because testing has been reduced. So I, would, I wouldn't do that shortcut. But it's true that if the situation were to last for many, many more months and that uh, all anti-doping organizations in the world would, would really struggle to, to conduct testing, I think then the questions would have to be asked to, to say, uh, are we as an anti-doping community able to guarantee to the athletes that there is a level playing field and that testing is to the required level to ensure a uh, clean and safe competition? So I think we're not there yet. As, as the graph has shown, uh, team, and, and as Andrea said, testing is is picking up hopefully the second wave would, will not be too impactful and that we will be able to to maintain that and um, and as we said before I, I think you know test, testing is only one weapon in our fight for clean sport we have others and we will have to find ways to be creative like like some ados have done to find new te testing techniques that are in in compliance with with the international standards uh, if this is not possible, we will have to be overly creative, uh, I guess, and, and increase efforts in the areas of intelligence, investigations, uh, education. Of course, prevention is always, to me, uh, the, the most valuable tool. Uh, and so, and so we, we will have to, to find those solutions. But I, I'm still hopeful that uh, as a sports community, all together, I think the athletes and, and us, we will work together to make sure that, that the Olympics has, are as clean as we can possibly do. Yeah. And if I may just add to that, Ben, I mean, the focus of testing as countries are coming out of uh, the confinement should be on those higher risk sports and athletes and those that are have qualified uh, for major events that have may have been postponed, but are coming up in the near future so that we can at least ensure that those athletes that are participating in these major events have been targeted uh, in advance and obviously something Ben and your team at the ITA is, is focusing on this through the pre-games uh, task force work, which is great. So, exactly. It's very thank you. And I, um, I think we're over time now. Uh, so thank you very much for our panelists, uh, Alan, Benjamin, Tim, Tim and Andrea. Thank you very much for taking part of this and all the information that you've provided. Um, to everyone that's been listening in, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I know there's a, a lot of questions that we haven't got to um, and I will endeavour in the, the, the next week or so to try and answer all those questions um, by email back to you. Uh, there is the, the questionnaire um, that you will be emailed um, after this or as you log out I think um, it will pop up. Um, if you could answer the questions on that that would be great. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, um, this is the first of a series of webinars uh, designed for athletes uh, put on by the WADA Athlete Committee. So um, please tune in. Um, we will release the, the date and topic of the next one, uh, hopefully in the next week. Um, and I hope that you'll find that enjoyable as well. Um, but lastly, um, please be safe out there. Um, good luck with all your, your training and future competitions. Um, and we know it's a you know, it's an incredibly uncertain time for everyone, so stay safe and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you for tuning in. Bye. Thank everyone. you. Goodbye. Okay. Bye, everyone.